Getco News special coverage of PDAC 2024 is brought to you by Gold Mining, Uranium Energy Corp, and Uranium Royalty Corp. Hey everyone, welcome back to coverage of PDAC 2024. I'm Jeremy Saffron with Kitco News. Now, obviously, it's been quite the year in the uranium market and it's just getting started. Our next guest is the CEO and president of Uranium Energy Corp, Amir Adnani. Thank you for joining us today. It's good to be back with you. I appreciate it. Yeah, you were on the show in December and here we are a few months later. We're walking around in Toronto. I'm a little bit curious what's changed. The market has come to a bit of corrective territory, but still supply and demand is there. Uh, prices have continued to move up, and even in the last few months, we've seen the price move from $50 to $105 right. with, before we see a little bit of a profit-taking type pullback, which is completely normal and healthy. The reality is that the fundamentals for nuclear energy and uranium are the best that we have ever seen. And the market is very much tight in terms of the physical tightness of supply. Uh, there is a supply deficit, both globally and particularly in the U.S., where we're focused with bringing on new uranium production with uranium energy. But just take the U.S. market, for example. The U.S. market will consume 47 million pounds of uranium in 2024, and current production is around a million pounds. That is a physical shortage, mm -hmm. right? And that's what's driving these uranium prices to a 15-year high. And uranium prices could really go to their all-time highs, which would be closer on an inflation-adjusted basis to $200 a pound. So uh, beyond that, I think the reality is, because this is the best fundamentals we have ever seen, uh, I think we're in a very exciting new period for uranium after about 11 years of an awfully long bear market. Yeah. And we gotta remember that end of it as well. Yeah, absolutely. Talk to me a little bit about bringing mines and restarting them back in the US. It's such an important cause. People don't realize you can't just go and find uranium. The biggest challenge facing the industry today that everyone's talking about is a really shortage of uh, skilled labor and the, the personnel side of it because the industry was dormant for so long. And just the timeline it takes to get permits, right. okay? so. That's where the production that we're restarting this year has such a competitive advantage. Uh, we're taking an in-situ recovery mine that was in operations until 2018, and we're restarting it. So to begin with, this is a brownfield project. This is already built. The uranium that we could take out of our Christensen Ranch mine will be processed at a facility, a processing facility, which is built already. And so, A, we don't have to go through that construction phase. We don't have to go through all the risk that may come with initial construction. We don't have to wait for permits to be issued, they're already issued. And the, the, the bulk of the team that was there in 2018 operating these, these mines are with our company today. And so we also address the personnel side of it. Now we're still gonna be hiring and training additional personnel, but we have some really core advantages with the setup that we have in Wyoming that's gonna facilitate this fast restart this year and it's also the fact that it's in-situ recovery. This is solution mining as opposed to open pit on the ground mining. And solution mining is much faster timelines to production and the capital intensity is the lowest in the business. Costs are low and the environmental footprint is very small. So these are again really important advantages that uh, sets what we're trying to do apart in Wyoming and Texas. Now our company, as you know, has conventional operations and projects in Saskatchewan. Right which we'll look to advance and develop as well. But the initial focus with fast and low capital intensity production will be in Wyoming and Texas. Now, 2023 was a year of geopolitical stuff everywhere. I mean, we've had wars. If there's a ban on Russia, uranium, and what's happening in Kazakhstan, do you think North America has an advantage here to get ahead? I, I, would, I would go as far as saying that the, the ban on Russian uranium imports is most likely a when as opposed to an if. And I, I believe we'll also see funding approved by the U.S. government for the Nuclear Fuel Security Act. That's also probably a when, not an if. And the bipartisan support that nuclear energy and uranium is enjoying right now uh, is really unprecedented. If we go back to cycles and we look at the 1970s and 1980s, the U.S. led the way globally for uranium mining. It was number one in the world. And nuclear fuel was the specialty that the U.S. was able to export and really be the top player in. Since the end of the Cold War, this leadership position was given away, in fact, to Russia. 
And today, I think what we're seeing is really a repatriation of the nuclear fuel cycle to the U.S. That's what there's bipartisan agreement on. And we will see that the geologic potential and the substantial history that the U.S. has and having been number one in uranium mining before is going to really pave the way to make sure that this growth period that we have in front of us in the U.S. Uh, is going to benefit really from this history uh, of this endowment that, uh, that we have in terms of both the traditions and the geologic uh, potential uh, and the longstanding history. All that is going to play a really big role. So there's nothing but growth in front of us in U.S. and North American uranium uh, production. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I mean, the cost of capital, especially for junior miners, people that actually want to get started, uh, is so expensive. And so if the government comes in and puts some incentives there, what do you think that'll do for the industry? Are we behind? Should this have happened two years ago? I think you could always look back and say uh, we're arguably behind. But I, but I think what's driving it this time isn't just the government policy. I think the government policy is very constructive mm -hmm. and very much needed. But the other thing that's happening in North America, and then again, the U.S. in particular, more than any other place, is the growth in uh, uh, artificial intelligence and the energy demands of artificial intelligence and the number of data centers that are projected to be built and have to be built to understand kind of what the energy landscape is going to be. Right. And that's actually been a very positive development for nuclear energy because many companies from Microsoft to Amazon and to Google have looked at the idea of small modular reactors being co-located next to data centers in order to power them consistently for a very long period of time. And that's where we're seeing unprecedented activity in the US for small modular reactors. In fact, we expect another billion dollars of funding potentially for SMRs in the US in the package that the house is currently uh, deliberating. And, and not just that, you look at Bill Gates' company, Terra Power, that has received funding, is advancing projects in Wyoming. We, in fact, have signed a memorandum of understanding with them to supply their future uranium needs. Sam Altman from ChatGPT is also behind his version of a small modular reactor. The bottom line is that public power utilities in the U.S. cannot keep up with the energy demand of new data centers moving forward. If you look at the number of GPUs that NVIDIA is going to keep selling every quarter moving forward, and correlate that to energy need, you're going to realize there's a huge gap there. And baseload, clean, large-scale energy from nuclear is the solution here. And there's now increasing amount of studies coming out that are showing this uh, uh, just unimaginable appetite that AI-driven data centers have that we simply don't have a plan for. And the best plan and solution are these SMRs. And that's why, even if you look at the Nuclear Energy Institute, they're expecting that nuclear energy capacity in the U.S. can double in the next 20 years, driven primarily by small and advanced modular reactors. Interesting. I mean, there is an opportunity for these SMRs. Let's educate the audience a little bit to change the world, even in places like Africa where power is not accessible. Uh, I'm curious, when we look at the R&D into SMRs and the small modular reactors, say that nine times, yeah. um, have we went too slow on this? Like, are we close to having some of these operational and starting to become more mainstream? I think we're at a very exciting inflection point for these in the coming years. Mm -hmm. The amount of capital investment that has gone into SMRs in the last four or five years has really accelerated and it's, it continues to accelerate. Uh, we're again seeing a whole new uh, category of players enter that arena. Uh, we're seeing Silicon Valley get behind it. As, as you heard me say, it's not utility companies leading the way with SMRs. It's Bill Gates, Sam Altman, and Elon Musk. It's, it's a whole other category of entrepreneurs with fairly deep pockets, with other strategic players like the US Department of Energy that are getting involved, and uh, companies like Rolls-Royce in the UK. And so again, I think like most things, if you invest and gain industrial scale, it increases the probability of gaining traction. And that's the inflection point that we're at with SMRs and advanced reactors. It's a game changer. It's an absolute game changer because larger traditional reactors that generate a gigawatts of electricity were historically a great way of powering large population centers and large cities. Mm -hmm. But for industrial activity, 
uh, we need a different capacity factor. You, you don't need a gigawatts. You may need 50 megawatts to 100 megawatts. You're seeing not just data centers, but companies like Dow Chemical have announced plans to put SMRs next to their petrochemical facilities to power those uh, activities or in the uh, oil sands in Alberta or mining projects that are in remote areas that are not connected to the grid. So there are a variety of large-scale industrial activities, the least of which is space travel, which is how Mr. Musk plans to get to Mars, is going to be all through nuclear energy, uh, which is how space travel has been powered for, the, for, for decades. So these are the very cool applications of nuclear energy that we don't talk about and haven't talked about that can transform the world so positively. Yeah, absolutely. And it's going very, very quickly. I'm, I'm curious over the next two years, say, I mean, we don't have a crystal ball here, but you're involved in this industry yeah. uh, in many, many different roles. Where's your dream here? What, where would you like to see nuclear in the next three years? I think nuclear has always been a, f a foundational uh, solution to baseload, reliable, emission-free energy. And we have seen increasing trends from Japan to the U.S. of the public opinion poll becoming favorable and supportive of nuclear energy, which has also been a problem and a challenge for nuclear energy uh, for, for many years. And, and, and so I think if we come to the realization that the science and technology and the facts behind nuclear energy absolutely are critical to supporting our needs as humanity as we continue to expand population as we continue to grow our carbon footprint, which we got to get under control. Right. It's an excellent carbon mitigation tool because it's emission free while giving us the big abundant energy that we need for all these amazing things that we're doing in society every day, right? So I'm just so excited about what nuclear energy can be as a solution for us. Uh, and I think in the coming years, it hopefully will be, again, not just this growing acceptance, but to see more reactors get built, large or small, around the globe. And look, as we speak, there are hundreds and hundreds of reactors at a planning stage. Yeah. stage. Yeah. Uh, there are over 60 under construction. And so the trend and the facts and the numbers and what's being proposed, it's all heading in that direction. At COP28 in Dubai a few months ago, we went from a pledge globally from countries, instead of doubling nuclear energy by 2050 to tripling nuclear energy by 2050. Uh, I'm so excited about everything that we're seeing. Yeah, what a fascinating time. It's going to be a fun year. Should be a fun year. Mir Adnani joining us, of course, CEO and president of Uranium Energy Corp. Thanks again for coming on. Likewise, thank you. I appreciate you. you. Uh, and thank you for joining us. I'm Jeremy Safran here at Kitco News, and we are at PDAC 2024. We'll have more coverage coming up after the break. Kitco News special coverage of PDAC 2024 is brought to you by Gold Mining, Uranium Energy Corp., and Uranium Royalty Corp.